Hello, brothers and sisters of Christ. If you want to turn in your Bible to Titus chapter 2, verse 13. Uh, we've talked about doing this study in the past. I'm get, the Lord's helped me get around to it. Are you looking for that blessed hope? This is just going to be an intro. Okay. We're going to take our time to slowly go over some things. And uh, in between, we'll be doing other studies. Uh, there's, I still have the question and answer video where there's some brethren asking some questions that we'll get into. So we're going to slowly go through this. Now, I don't want to take my time with this study. Uh, are you looking? What does it actually mean to look for that blessed hope? So Titus chapter 2, verse 13, we read. We're going to turn to Titus chapter 2, verse 13. In your King James Bibles, for English-speaking people, it's God's perfect written word for English-speaking people. This, and the, the very first part of this study, here it is. the very first part, when we get the first part, is about doctrine. So we're going to talk about doctrine. Bottom line, this is the foundation in our, of all matters of faith and practice. Okay, Make sure you get a King James Bible. Make sure you're reading it every day, which will also be in this study, in this series of studies. Right. So Titus chapter 2, verse 13, we read, Looking for that blessed hope. That's where we get the title. Are you looking for that blessed hope? Right. Notice it's 13. There's 12 verses before this. We're going to talk about that. Titus chapter 2, verse 13. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. Now, I'm not going to get too much into this because a lot of the studies, these series of studies, we're going to go back to the milk. We're going to go back to some of the basics. It seems like some of us have been saved for a while, we learn the basics, we're getting into the meat, and then sometimes we're forgetting the milk. And sometimes it's good to go back to the milk. Mm -hmm. But not to get too much into it, zealous of good works. The Bible says, if you suffer with Jesus Christ, you shall also reign with Jesus Christ. From the death of Jesus Christ to the catching away of the body of Christ is called the time of the Gentiles. Sometimes we also say the church age. Okay? Because when the church leaves, the time of Jacob's trouble comes in, which is a seven year time period falsely called the Great Tribulation. It's not the Great Tribulation. In those days there shall be Great Tribulation. But in that seven year time period, it is called the time of Jacob's trouble or Daniel's 70th week. Okay. When we come back at the day of the Lord, if we suffer with him, we get to come back at the day of the Lord and we get to rule and reign with Jesus Christ. We get to be servants for Jesus Christ and we'll be zealous of good works. The Lord says, this is what I want. We go out and make it happen. Okay. Himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. Verse 15, these things speak, speak, and exhort, and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. Uh, brother, uh, men in ministry, every once in a while should always come back and remind people what we're looking forward to up there. That this isn't it. Down here is not it. Okay? Someday we're going to get caught up. Jesus said that in my Father's house, and I've said this before, and I know some people... I'm trying not to get into the attacks and the criticism, but some people complain, oh, you quote the same verses all the time. I quote a lot of verses over and over. Okay. Here's another one, and I'm going to do it again. Jesus said, in my Father's house there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto me. And I'm kind of paraphrasing that last part. I still got to get into those verses. Um, but bottom line, that's what Jesus is right now. He's preparing a place for us. The Bible talks about rewards in heaven, earning rewards in heaven. Okay. Uh, the judgment seat of Christ. Someday when we get caught up, we're going to be standing before Jesus Christ, and our works are going to be judged. And we're going to be rewarded based off our works as far as a life as a Christian. Our salvation isn't determined by our works, but our rewards are in heaven. Okay. That's, that's what we're looking forward to. Sometimes we can get so distracted by what's going on down here that we forget what's going on up there. We forget our final destination. This isn't eternity. That is up there. And we go to be with our Lord and Savior for all eternity. And some of us will get to be able to come back down and serve Him in the day of the Lord that I just talked about. Brethren, sometimes you need to remind yourself of that. As some of the preachers out there are starting to forget that, and they start getting distracted by what's going on in the world, you need to take it upon yourself to read the Bible and say, what about the precious promises God promised me? I'm sealed into the day of redemption. What's that day of redemption? The catching away of the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. 
Now it says here looking. What does it mean to look for that blessed hope? I've always said this before. Does it say believing in that blessed hope? Because that's what some people try to mess it up and say, oh, it's just, I believe, I believe, I believe in the pre-time of Jacob's trouble catching away the body of Christ, which is the proper term, Bible term. Pre-time of Jacob's trouble catching away, caught up, will be caught up, catching away. When there's multiple caught-ups, the word is catching. Okay, catching away of the body of Christ. I believe, I believe. But it doesn't say believe. It says looking. It's an action. Looking to expect, to be in a state of expectation. Man's heart failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. In right? the time of Jacob's trouble, men's hearts will fa be failing them for fear in the book of Revelation. Right? They're going to be seeing things and they're going to try to expect it. In other words, they're going to try to save themselves. They're going to do everything they can to try to make it through of their own accord. And if that means compromising and taking the mark and worshiping the beast, a lot of them will be. And if you look and read Revelation, a lot of them are cursing God. They see what's going on. They know it's God doing it. And instead of repenting, instead of falling on their knees, they curse God. Right? Luke 21, 28 says, And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your head, for your redemption draweth nigh. The whole point of seeing what's going on in the world, because the Bible does give us signs of, if you see this going on, we're getting closer to the catching away of the body of Christ. You see that? We're getting closer to the end. You see this? We're getting closer to the end. Right? The Bible does say that. But the whole point of seeing this stuff is to strengthen. We talked about this in the eight-point checklist of, uh, are you ready? Uh, being a good soldier for Jesus Christ. When you see what's going on in the world, it's to strengthen the things that remain. Okay? When you see what's going on, and you're actually looking, like the Bible says, be watchful. What it does is it's supposed to strengthen the things that remain. We're times almost running out. I gotta get busy for the Lord. I gotta get busy living for the Lord. I gotta get busy doing the things that the Lord has told me I'm supposed to do. I'm supposed to be reading this book every day. Start my day with this book. End this day with my book. I'm supposed to get into the doctrines, because that's gonna be the first study. Doctrines. Okay? I'm supposed to know this book. I'm supposed to take this book, and I'm going to, I know I'm going to quote another verse I quote a lot. I want to take this book, and I'm going to hide it in my heart. The Bible says, Thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. It's in the Psalms. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. That's also in the Psalms. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Okay? Brothers and sisters, Christ, when we see what's going on in the world, it's a motivator for us to live for Jesus Christ. It's not supposed to be a distraction. It's not supposed to get us fearful where we start fearing the world and what's going on in the world, and we stop fearing the number one man that we're supposed to be fearing, and that's Jesus Christ. Okay? Jesus is God fully and completely, and the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Okay? There's one meter between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Jesus Christ. That's the man to fear. Right. Now, the Bible says we're not given a spirit of fear, but of love and, and a, uh, uh, love and a sound mind. I want to get that right. I'm sorry. Sometimes I want to throw the word peace in there. I wonder if I'm right. So we say. 2 Timothy 1.17 For God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, Love and a sound mind. Power, love, and a sound mind. He's given us authority over our own bodies that I didn't have when I wasn't saved. My, I was carnally minded, walking after the flesh. Now I'm spiritually minded, capital S, spiritually minded, walking after the spirit. And God has given me the authority and power to put the flesh down. Okay? So no matter what's going on in this world, we're not supposed to use it as a, deter a justification for us falling away into sin and wickedness. But when you're looking for something... You get prepared for it. This is the whole point of what I'm making with this definition. To expect to be in a state of expectation. In a state of expectation. In other words, you're ready for it. Okay? If you're going to go fishing, brothers and sisters of Christ, if you're going to go fishing, you have a man sitting there in a suit and tie. He's just sitting there in a suit and tie. And he's sitting there with a bunch of other guys in a suit and tie. Are these guys ready to go fishing? Are they expecting to go fishing? Are they expecting to catch some fish? No. 
Now you get this guy that he has the hat that has all the hooks in it and everything and he's got the vest on, he's got his uh, fishing rod, he might have a little boat, um, and he's ready to go fishing. Is he ready to go fishing? Is he looking to catch some fish? Absolutely. The men in suit and ties, are they like they're ready to go to, to the Wall Street or something for the stock market exchange? Right? Are they looking to go catch some fish? No. If you're looking for something, your actions and how you get prepared determine if you're truly looking for that something. The same thing goes for that blessed hope. If you're truly looking for the blessed hope, your actions, the life that you live, is going to show it. Some brethren have put off the blessed hope. Oh, Jesus isn't coming for five years. Why? So they don't have to prepare for it. They can start falling into the world, sin for a season, traditions of men, um, covetousness, which is idolatry. Right? And I've said it again, but I'll go back and say it again. Sin for a season. They forget that God could come back any day now, or they choose not to believe anymore that God can come back any day now, looking, present tense, for that blessed hope. We don't know what day Jesus is coming back. Okay, we don't know. So we are taught by the scriptures that we're supposed to live every day as if Jesus could come back today. We're supposed to. Paul did. And one of the things that, uh, they, that people who turn their back on that, looking for that blessed hope, they'll say, well, Paul said his time was drawing near. He wasn't looking for the blessed hope. No, there's a difference between someone telling you you're going to be executed next week, and he says his time is drawing near. Not that he turned his back on looking for that blessed hope, but he's like, if God tarries, I'm going to be killed. My time draws near no matter what, whether we have the catching away of the body of Christ, or I get beheaded, or hanged, or burned at the stake. I'm going through all the martyrs, burned at the stake. Okay. Tortured. Regardless, my time draweth near because he knew his time was drawing near. Not that he, he just all of a sudden decided, I'm not looking for that blessed hope. No, no, no. He taught that we're to look for that blessed hope. He was looking every day with the life that he was living for that blessed hope. And we're going to get that in some of the verses in, in this. But what is the blessed hope? But first, let's say what the Bible does. The Bible talks about hope, that hope, a lot. First, you know... Uh, you don't have to turn here, but first, because it's just an intro. First Thessalonians 5, 8, because we've talked about these verses a lot. But if you want to, you can always pause the video and turn. I always like pausing regardless, pausing and turning. But First Thessalonians 5, 8. But let us, whoever the day, be sober, be sober. If you're sober, you can be watchful. If you're not sober, you're not paying attention. Be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. Once again, we talked about that. Now, are you ready? Uh, are you, are you ready? To study the eight-point checklist of being a soldier for Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, and one of those was the helmet for a hope of salvation. Brethren are taking it off. You have men in ministry that are taking it off and promoting you to take it off, okay? Because they're no longer looking for that blessed hope. They've put it off. Oh, I still believe in the pre-time of Jacob's trouble catching with the body of Christ. I just don't believe in looking for that blessed hope anymore. I'm too distracted by what I have down here. Not the Bible, but in the world, down here, what we have down here. I too can get distracted, brother says Christ. This house is falling apart. I have responsibilities. Uh, I've got the chickens. Uh, we've got another bobcat. I need prayer for that, brother says Christ. Another bobcat that I'm trying to catch. And he's killed three of my chickens. Three of my hens. i got to let them out every once in a while to do their dust baths, like at least once a week. And I turn my back for just a second. Boy, that guy... Snatched him, jumped over the fence, chicken alive, carried the chicken over the fence. I was able to get back there and get a couple shots off, but uh, he's gotten three of my chickens. So um, I know I have responsibilities. I've got things that kind of distract me a little bit. I got the garden, okay. I'm, I got distractions like of jo of good things, but there's still distractions like the ocean here. Getting to go for a walk. There's beauty out here. I can sit out on the deck. There's Bible studies to be done, but there's times I want to sit on the deck instead of doing the Bible studies. There's always distractions, brothers and Christ. But we're not to let it take that helmet off. We've got to keep that helmet on at all times. We've got to keep our eyes and our heart heavenly minded, in other words. This is not it. Am I read, did I read my Bible this morning or did I jump up and just start doing all my chores ASAP and forget to read my Bible this morning? I've done that sometimes, brothers and Christ. I get so... 
I got this to do, I got this, I got a whole list of things to do. Did I start the day with the Word of God? No, I didn't. I need to stop everything immediately and spend five to ten minutes to read the Word of God and talk with the Lord this morning. You need to do that. But we see here the hope of salvation. What's the hope of salvation? Okay, to catch away the body of Christ. This is not it. Someday I'm going to be caught up in death and get to be with my Lord and Savior, and someday I might be caught up in life. We're all going to be caught up in life, because remember, we're going to read the verse here coming up, but the dead in Christ shall be raised first. But someday this isn't it. Someday I'm going to be with my Lord and Savior, and I'm going to have an incorruptible body, and I'm going to be serving Him and being with the brethren. We're all going to be, remember the song, I like to sing that song, um, There's Coming a Day, right? Uh, there's not going to be any more division. We're all going to be of one mind. We're all going to be of the same mind and the same judgment. We're all going to be striving together to serve the Lord for all eternity. That's where my heart is. That's where my eyes are on. But i got to start getting ready now. Not to earn it, but preparing for it. We're going to get called home today. There's things we're supposed to be doing while we're looking for that blessed hope. And that's what this whole study is going to be about, the series of studies. We're going to go over several of them. Uh, 1 Peter 3.15 we read, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. In your hearts. Now, out of the abundance of the mouth, the heart speaks. With the heart man believes unto righteousness, but the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Someone can make a false profession, and it's not coming from the heart. It's got to come from the heart, and it comes out here. And be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. You know, we preach against hell when it comes to salvation, but you know some people, they see the hope in you. The world around us could be falling apart. This world is already falling apart. It's getting so bad out there that some of the brethren have turned from telling you to ha from pointing you to that blessed hope. They've turned around to trying to tell you you need to prep and endure to the end. Instead of telling you you need to remember that blessed hope. That no matter what happens down here, God's got it under control. We get to go be with Him. Times get so tough that people don't want the Word, and God says, you know what, Philip? It's not time for the catching away, but you've done your best. I'm, it's, you're good to go. Come home. And He drops me dead, but either I get martyred, whatever. And I come home, I get to be with my Lord and Savior. Death doesn't scare me anymore. And it shouldn't scare you, brother, says Christ. It used to when I was lost. But we're supposed to have this hope so when the lost world sees us, they don't have that hope. I was like, this isn't it. Um, a testimony, the fire was, I said this before, the fire was going to come through here, it was eight miles away. And the fire blew, the wind blew so hard that the fire traveled four miles in one day, so it went from being eight miles away from this house to four miles away from this house. So we had to evacuate, and I went to Gold Beach and went to one of the schools in Gold Beach. I had this. I had my uh, tablet where I was listening to Bible studies. I was highlighting. I had a Bible like this, this Bible right here. It was all highlighted. And I remember telling you the story that there's uh, professing Christians that I went into because I highlighted my Bible and was actually studying the Bible and reading it and actually studying it. They thought I was a pastor. That's, that's something only pastors do. You know, that's something everyone needs to be doing. We all need to be reading the Bible and studying the Bible and hiding God's Word in our heart. Okay? But the point is, is they, a lot of them were wondering why I wasn't so scared. You could lose everything. This isn't it. And I was able to witness to some of them. This life isn't it. And I told them, even the ones that claimed to be saved, I said, the real Jesus Christ of the King James Bible, which is God's perfect written Word, has given me precious promises. I'm storing rewards in heaven. What I have down here, this isn't it. This isn't all there is. Convicted some of them. Uh, I don't think any. I don't. I don't think any of them got saved. I don't know. It's that was that happened. What five years ago? Four years ago? It was a long time ago. But brothers, says Christ, we're supposed to uh, always be ready to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of hope that is in you with meekness and fear. And as we get into the study about. Um, Doctrines, we're supposed to take this word and try to memorize what we can and put it in our hearts. The doctrines, the teachings, so then we give someone an answer for hope, reason of hope. We're doing it through the scriptures, not our own words, not our feelings and opinions. We're supposed to use scripture, God's words. 
hide them in our hearts, and be ready to give an answer to man that re reason of hope, that asketh you a reason of hope. This world's falling apart. What's the point? Let me show you what the point is. It's to let you know you need to get saved. Here's some promises God got for saved people. But you got to come to Him broken. Hmm? Ephesians 2.11 we read, Wherefore remember, Ephesians 2.11, Wherefore remember that ye being in times past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision, by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands. Okay? If, you don't, if you're new, the Jews had to be circumcised and keep the laws of Moses in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, it's spiritual circumcision. We don't have to have the physical, the Gentiles. When Jesus came, salvation was of the Jews. When they rejected Jesus Christ, salvation went out to the world, to the Gentiles also. Okay? We are the uncircumcision. It's referring to Gentiles. Verse 12, that at the time you were without Christ, this is talking to saved sinners, but they're past before they got saved. At the time, and that's me, at the time I was without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenant of promise, having no hope, and without God in the world. What's different now? I have hope and I have God. I have the Holy Spirit in me. Jesus said the Comforter will come and will guide us into all truth. He'll open the scriptures to us. He'll teach us how to take the scriptures and, apply, and hide them in our heart and apply them to our life. Right? And the hope, the blessed hope, this isn't it. You're not going to hell. I'm not going to hell. Those who are saved, saved sinners, we're not going to hell. We're not going to be tossed in the lake of fire. And this world isn't it. We get to go to heaven. We get to spend eternity serving our, our Savior, God, the one true God, Jesus Christ, and being a servant to each other for all eternity. Now we have hope. But before we were saved, we didn't have hope. And we didn't have the Holy Spirit. We didn't have God in us. But now in Christ Jesus, she who are sometimes were far off are made nigh. So how do you get that hope? How do you get the Holy Spirit? We're made nigh by the blood of, Jesus, of Christ. Jesus Christ. By getting saved. When you get saved, you're not done. Okay, I got saved, I'm done. I can just do whatever I want. No, 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 no. You get saved, now God puts you on the right path, and now there's work to be done. you got to live for Jesus Christ till He calls us home. He either calls you home in death, or calls you home in life. I always say that. Death. If I die before they catch me in the body of Christ, I get called up. My soul does. If I get to be blessed with getting to live, to see... Uh, to be alive during the catch away of the body of Christ, then we all get caught up. Body, soul, and spirit. We get new bodies, which we're going to read about here in a second. 2 Corinthians 4.17 says, when you have no hope and without God in the world, 2 Corinthians 4.17, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. The hardships we go down here are supposed to meant to point us to Jesus Christ and help us keep our eyes on Jesus Christ, dependent on Jesus Christ, help us to stay in His Word and living the life of Christ. That's why we have chastisement down here. But the, God will chastise us because He loves us to get us back on the right path. But it says there, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment. This life down here is just a blink compared to eternity. You just blink your eyes, that's this life down here. It's but for a moment. And sometimes we forget that, brothers of Christ. We get so distracted. We got this to do, we got that to do, this is going on in the world. I gotta prep and I gotta do this. And I this is all just for but for a moment. You know what you gotta do? Read your Bible. You know what you gotta do? Pray. You know what you gotta do? Make sure you're hiding God's word in your heart and you're loving it. When was the last time you uh, went out and gospel tracked, laid gospel tracks places? When someone op uh, op like says, this, what's the point of this life? That's an open door for you to preach Jesus Christ to them. How many open doors do you miss because, like this guy right here, how many open doors do you miss because you lack the courage or you're in too much of a hurry with this life? I've had to slow down, learn to slow down. God has had to give me courage. There's times there's open doors and, I'm, and I, 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 I walk right past them. This life is but for a moment, brothers and sisters of Christ. 
don't get too, um, what's the word that, uh, invested. Don't get too invested with the things of this world. Okay. There's nothing wrong with having things. There's nothing wrong with having responsibilities and everything. By all means, you've got responsibilities. But don't get so invested with this world that you're not investing up there. Okay. That your eyes aren't up there. You're not, you're not looking, looking for that blessed hope. 1 Corinthians 15.51 Here we go. What is that blessed hope in more detail? Behold, I show you a mystery. In other words, we don't know when it's going to happen. We don't know when it's going to happen. We're supposed to look for it every day. Like some people say, well, it's been 2,000 years and it still hasn't happened. Yeah, it's been 2,000 years and it still hasn't happened. But every saved sinner has always been taught through the scriptures that we're supposed to be looking for it every day with the life that we're living. Have you actually looked in a lot? I've been looking at a lot of the hymns. A lot of the hymns talk about being caught up, us going home. A lot of the old hymns. Oh, they weren't looking for the catching way. Yes, they were. Yes, they were. In their lifetime, they were looking for it. Don't believe the lies out there, our brethren that have turned their back on absolute truth, the catching away of the body of Christ. It can happen any day, and that's how you're supposed to live. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. That's what happens in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye. I'm in this wicked body that's overweight, that's falling apart, and then, boom, I have a perfect body. It might be a 30-year-old body. I go back to my 30-year-old self. And a perfect body, white robes. That's the moment of twinkling of an eye. We're not just going to disappear and we're gone. We're going to get our new bodies in the moment of twinkling of an eye. Okay? There's another verse that talks about how the, uh, that we will be, we'll be, the dead in Christ shall rise first. And then we which remain shall be caught up with them to be with them in the clouds. I believe that takes some time and the world gets to see it. It's an event that the whole world sees. You can't hide it. They try to explain it away, you know. Alien invasion, alien invasion, something, you know. Abduction, alien abduction, not invasion. Alien abduction or something. But they can't deny something happened. It's going to be a big, huge event, I believe. Okay? But we shall be changed. That's what happens in a moment of twinkling of an eye. For this corruption must put on incorruption. This mortality must put on immortality. This mortal must put on immortality. So when the, this corruptible shall put on incorruption, and this mortal shall put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying which was written, Death is swallowed up in victory, the law of sin and death. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? There's no more death for us anymore. The dead in Christ shall rise first. This is going to happen, but the dead in Christ get raised in their incorruptible body. That's the saints that died, or the Christians, Bible-believing, God-fearing men and women that have died before, like Paul, and like Peter, like John, like Titus, like the, we're reading Titus, Timothy, okay, Silas, right? Barnabas, even though he fell away, Barnabas, okay? all all the Old, Test, uh, Old Testament saints were already caught up when Jesus was caught up. But all the Bible-believing, God-fearing men, the Church of God, from the death of Jesus Christ to the catching away of the body of Christ, if they die before the catching away, they're going to be raised first and get their incorruptible bodies, and they're going to start going up. And we, which remain, are going to start going up with them after we get our new bodies. Right? We will no longer die anymore. There will be no longer any more death for us. We will never have to face growing old, getting tired, getting hungry, back pain, knee pain. <laughs> That's what I struggle with a lot these days. Back pain, knee pain, okay? Gray in the beard, all right? That's age, you know, getting old. Death, no more death. Verse 56, the sting of death is sin and corruptible bodies. All sin will be forgiven. That's what we read in John. Remember we did that study on what's the impartable sin for today? Well, there is none, because God cleanses us from all. In 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, God cleanses us from all unrighteousness. Okay? There's going to come a day that we still have to answer for our life as a Christian, but we get caught up, all our sins are gone and washed away. We set up the judgment city to Christ, the bad works, the sin, the stuff that we're supposed to have shame, it gets burnt away. And what's left is the gold and silver and precious stones. 
The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. Remember, the law is a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. But verse 57, But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory, through works? No, through our Lord Jesus Christ. One of the big things we're going to get into, looking for that blessed hope, means the gospel, preaching the gospel to the lost world. Praising the Lord and thanking Him for saving you. I, Brothers and Christ, there seems like in these last days, especially with this ministry, has been and all the attacks this ministry has suffered and everything these last days. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. Um, I always forget to, to unplug it. It's usually a telemarketers and everything. But brothers and sisters in Christ, I, I, there's days that I don't even go, go through without saying, Lord, thank you for saving me. Thank you, thank you, Lord, for saving me. I look back at my life before I was saved and what, where I could be right now sometimes. It's like, Lord, I'd be even worse than I was then. This world is getting so bad. I thank you, Lord, for saving me. And it helps me remember that God saved me, not so I could do what I want and do what I want, my own feelings and opinions. God saved me so I could live for Him. And that's what we're supposed to do through our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 58, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Your labor is not in vain. My labor is not in vain. I'm getting attacked hardcore by people who once called me brethren. Okay? I mean, I mean I'm ha they're trying to attack me through my daughter. They're attacking me through my ex-wife. They're attacking me through my beard. They're attacking me through my sweater. They're attacking me through my hats. They're attacking me through the banners I use. They're attacking me through anything except this. And sometimes they'll take this and pervert it. Okay? But I'm being attacked. Right? Know that your work is not in vain. Brother Sister Christ, in these last days, that's a whole other study, study to go through about being stabbed in the back. Uh, I think it's in Zechariah, it talks about being, Jesus was talking about, it's a prophecy for Jesus being wounded in the house of my friend, friends. Okay? Being wounded in the house of my friends. The biggest scars you're going to have is when you get, get hurt by people you love and care about. When you have brothers and sisters in Christ turn on you. And they, today, today, the words can be very vicious, very cruel, very wicked that they use against you to try to... Know that your work is not in vain. I'm looking for that blessed hope. And we're going to get back to doing Bible studies. Okay? We're not going to let them deter us, brothers and sisters Christ. Titus chapter 2, where we're at right here. Titus chapter 2. I could have gone back to verse 12 and made this a quick, easy study. But God put it on my heart to go all the way back to verse 1 because there's so much in Titus chapter 1 that has to do with looking for that blessed hope, what we're supposed to be doing with our lives, everything. There's just so much in there. So we're going to read over it, and then we're going to slowly break it down, and we're going to make a series where we're going to go over different parts of this chapter, and we're going to do Bible studies on it. Even if it means doing multiple part Bible studies, we're going to do it. Brothers and Christ, in these last days, I I'm, I'm, I'm have such a burden for the body of Christ, I'm tired of seeing brethren fall away. I'm tired of seeing brethren fall into pride, bitterness, hate. Okay, I'm tired of all the fighting and backbiting down here, or who's the greatest, or this person's this, and that person that, and I've done this, and I've done that, and you don't give God glory in any of it, you just claim you did it, but you don't give God glory. You're taking all the glory. I'm tired of seeing the brethren fall away, and I am starting to make some mistakes. I don't want to fall away. I don't want you to fall away. What's the best way to keep us from doing that? Keeping our eyes on Jesus Christ, looking for that blessed hope. So Titus chapter 2, verse 1, we're just going to read through it all. But speak thou the things which come, become sound doctrine, that the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in the faith, in charity and patience, the aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers. I found that very interesting. I'm not supposed to, I'm not want to go over it now. We'll go over it more in the series. But I find that interesting because women used to be the big ones that gossiped, backbiting and whispering. But now everyone's doing it, men and women. But the women are the ones that are not false accusers, not giving too much wine, teachers of good things, 
And I'm not trying to put down women, but sisters in Christ would say yes. Women back in the past, men were working hard, men were, women were being keepers at home, but you had those certain women that would fall into the trap of gossip. Okay? Now it seems like everybody's in the gossip game. Everybody is, men and women. Okay? Teachers of good things. Okay? Can elderly women teach younger women things uh, when it comes to the Bible? Yes, good things. And then it lists those good things. They're allowed to use the Bible to teach the younger women how to be discreet how to be chaste, how to be keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. That's what they're allowed to teach. And only that. They need to stay within the boundary that God set. Well, i got to teach them what's going on in the world, and, and i got to show them this, and i got to... No, 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 no. You stick with, with the boundaries that God set for you. But we'll get into that more, uh, more into that in the series of studies. Chapter six, uh, verse 6, young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded. The elder men are supposed to be teaching like the young men to be sober-minded and exhort them to be sober-minded. And all things showing thyself a pattern of good works. Okay, what does the Bible say? All scriptures given by inspiration of God is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works works. The elder man that know the Bible, because they were taught by someone before them, and taught, or they read the Bible and the Lord teaches them through the Holy Spirit, or the Holy Spirit bears witness, witness that's in them with men that, of, that are teaching them. But the whole point is, is you're passing that down to the next generation of, sa of, of saved sinners, and then the next, and then the next. The elder that teach the younger. Through this, that's why it started out, sound doctrine. You teach the brethren through this. Not through this, through this. Not through the world, conforming to the world, through the Word of God. Not feelings and opinions. But that's how we find good works. In doctrine, because here it goes, in doctrine, showing uncorruptness. We need to teach them, here's the doctrine, you need to stand for it, you need to not fall away and start corrupting what the Bible doctrines are. Like I said, one of them is looking for that blessed hope that goes hand in hand with truly, truly believing in your heart in the catching way of the body of Christ before the time of Jacob's trouble. Right? Eternal security is one. We're going to be talking about a lot of those things. And doctrine showing uncorruptness. Gravity, sincerity. Okay, in doctrine, you're supposed to have uncorruptness in doctrine. You're supposed to have gravity in doctrine and sincerity. Verse 8, sound speech that cannot be condemned. Lately, uh, even I need to work on this. Sometimes I try to slip up. And, uh, how many of you heard it's okay to be sarcastic? It's okay to be sarcastic sometimes. Well, lately the sarcasm has gotten so much in the body of Christ, it doesn't sound like, like a little bit of sarcasm. It sounds like, you, like I was when I was a little kid, when I'd mouth off to my mom and, uh, and when my dad was alive, or my stepdad. It sounds like me that I'd have to get my two cents in, I'm mouthing off. It's not sarcasm anymore. It sounds like there's men in ministry that they're just mouthing off. They're acting like little children, okay? It says here, showing yourself a pattern, um, a sound speech that cannot be condemned. The Bible talks about sincerity and truth. We're supposed to speak in sincerity and truth, sin sincerity and in truth, and meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves in meekness, not yelling at them, not mocking them, not name calling, not putting them down, like judging them on the outward appearance and putting them down, okay? Not being sarcastic. In sincerity and truth, sound speech, right? They cannot be condemned, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed. They can call me names all they want. I'm not going to turn around and call them names. I'm just going to preach the truth to them, show them what they are. Either they're lost, wolves in sheep's clothing, or they're brethren that have fallen away, and they should be ashamed. How they're treating me, I'm not going to turn around and treat them that way. You don't reward, the Bible says, you don't reward evil with evil, but you overcome evil with good. That's how we're supposed to be. So the contrary part might be ashamed. When you don't, he, he, he didn't treat me the way I treated him. And it starts making people be ashamed. Having no evil thing to say of you, exhort servants to be obedient unto their own masters and to please them well in all things, not answering again. We'll be talking about that too. How you're supposed to treat your employer that could be saved or lost. Okay. I know we've had brethren that 
have one of their prayer requests is, I want a better job. The job I have now, I'm around filthiness and wickedness, the people, the way they talk, and this and that. Uh, granted, if your job itself is something wicked, I'm praying that you get another job. But if the job itself is not wicked, it's just the atmosphere is a tough atmosphere. God's got you there for a reason, to be a light to those people, to hold those people accountable. Don't fall in the trap of talking like they do, having fun like they do. Um, and uh, compromising to please your boss, but you're supposed to, what it says here, okay? Exhort servants to be obedient unto their masters and please them well in all things. You give it your all at that job, 100%. Right? No matter what. You take the beatings, you take the, the, the lickings, as they say, and you keep working and you keep being a light for the Lord. Verse 10, not purloining, but showing all good fidelity that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. You're doing it so they can get saved. Okay? That's why you're enduring, and you don't react to them the way they react to you. Verse 11, for the grace of our God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. Once again, brothers of Christ, I've said it before, people have no problem, they get the verbal Okay, when it comes to um, the ministry of reconciliation, they get the verbal part where you preach in the gospel uh, and your verbal testimony. But what they, the brethren as a whole are having a hard time with today, Brother Says Christ, is the living testimony. You can lead people to Christ with your words, and you can lead people to Christ with the life that you live for Him. How you react to this world. Like I said, those people up there, when I had the fire that came through here, and I'm pointing towards Gold Beach, um... They looked at me and was like, why aren't you scared? You're gonna, you could lose everything. My actions and my love for the Lord and my trust for the Lord understand that this isn't it. That is where I'm going to someday. My demeanor, how I was living my life, Bible studying, uh, not cussing, not getting into dr drinking. There was a couple of them up there that they were smoking a lot and some of them were drinking a little bit. They couldn't do it there. They had to do it off. And it's like they were starting to stress out and everything. How we live our life for Jesus Christ can lead people to Jesus Christ. You can be a living witness, a living testimony of who Jesus Christ is and what he did for you. That you're a new creature in Christ Jesus. That's not the same man. I, I once knew that man, but that's not the same man anymore. He's different. Okay? You can be a living testimony. That's what that's talking about when it comes to being a servant and working for lost people. Okay? You can still be a living testimony. You can lead people to Christ by your reaction, how you react to them and how you treat people. And then we get into number 12, verse 12. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. That pretty much sums up really everything we talked about up there. That sums up verses 1 through 11. Teaching us that denying ungodliness, that's what a lot of the doctrines do. Ungodliness and worldly lust. It gets us away from the world and focused on living for Jesus Christ. Okay? We should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. That's what it means, ultimately. That verse, if you could sum up all these teachings we're going to do, that's verse. But I want to get into it and actually do some Bible studies, brothers of Christ. Get back into the Word of God and hide in God's Word in our heart. And I love going through the Scriptures. I love the Word of God, and I pray you do too. Um, so the verse, verse 1 states, Speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. So the first start of this study series is going to be sound doctrine. What is doctrine? What does sound mean? Why does the Bible put a lot of emphasis on the importance of sound doctrine? So that will be our first series. Okay, We're going to get into Okay, Are you looking sound doctrine? Are you staying in this book? And getting into the sound doctrines and keeping them fresh in your heart and in your head so you can share them with the brethren to exhort the brethren or to be ready to give hope. Be ready to give hope to someone who's lost. Okay? I know where I'm going. I have a little uh, magnet on my car that says, if you were to die tonight, would you go to heaven or hell? It gets them to think. So I want to end this with grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all and my love for you which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you for watching and I will see you in the first series of this study which is going to be Are You Looking Sound Doctrine? Question mark. Are you looking?
See you later.